Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. Again, my name is Michelle Smith. I work as a biologist with the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. And this afternoon, I'm here to talk with you about what beekeepers can do to protect your hives from damage by black bears. So this afternoon, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the natural habits and behaviors of black bears so that you're more familiar when these animals are naturally on the move throughout the year. I'll touch on what our biologists do to research and manage our state's growing and expanding bear population and consequently some problems that do occur with black bears. And most importantly, I am going to run through recommendations that beekeepers should follow if you are installing an electric fence to make sure that it's truly effective at preventing damage by black bears. So the first thing I wanted to show everyone is our current distribution of black bears throughout our state of New Jersey. So on this map where you see the green color, that is where we've had confirmed bear sightings in recent years. And it is in all of New Jersey's 21 counties. Now, the heart of our bear population is within northwestern New Jersey. So specifically, if you're living within Sussex, Passaic, Warren, uh, Warren or Morris counties, that is what we refer to as bear country. But more and more in recent years, as our population continues to increase, we are seeing black bears spread further eastward and southward in the state. So if you are a beekeeper in South Jersey, again, it is possible that you will have these animals passing through the area. Just this past summer, we had bears moving through uh, Salem, Camden, uh, Camden, Gloucester, and Cumberland counties. It got a lot of publicity when we actually had a black bear showing up in Vineland this past summer. So again, people statewide do have to take precautions and recognize the fact that these animals might be moving through the area. Now, black bears do need to live in forested habitat. New Jersey's forests provide bears with all the food, shelter, space, clean water, everything that they need to survive. And when it comes to a black bear's diet, these animals are omnivores. So they do eat both plants and animals, but most of their diet, more than 70% of the foods they consume, does come from different kinds of vegetation. However, it is important to mention that black bears are what we call opportunistic omnivores. They are not picky about what they eat, and they will take advantage of any easy food source they can find. Now, naturally, these animals are eating a variety of different foods, and right now, through the winter months, a black bear here in New Jersey could go up to five months without eating any food. So when these bears start to emerge from their winter dens, starting in early March, we see a lot of bear activity within our state as these animals are actively on the move looking for foods to eat. And they are eating all the vegetation that is starting to grow in the forest. But keep in mind that early spring is a time of year that people in residential areas might have bears coming through the area. And our beekeepers here in New Jersey, early spring is a time of year that they may very well incur damage by a black bear. Throughout the summer months, these animals are primarily eating fruits and wild berries out in New Jersey's forests. And as we get into the fall, that is another time of year when these animals are actively on the move looking for food to get fattened up for the winter time. To give you a better perspective, every day in the fall, a black bear has to consume at least 20,000 calories worth of food in order to get enough weight on their body to survive the winter months. So early spring and fall again are two peak times of year that we do see an increase in bear activity and they might be moving into those residential areas. In the fall, they're primarily eating nuts like acorns. While these animals are on the move, they will occasionally eat other animals, any carcasses they come across, and insects are a fabulous source of protein for black bears. So for beekeepers, bears are not only going to eat honey, they're also going to eat those adult bees and the bee larvae if they can get access to them. Black bears have an excellent sense of smell. They can actually smell food sources more than three miles away. So again, when bears are in an area, people really have to take precautions 
to secure potential food sources from these animals. Black bears are also excellent climbers. So some homeowners think that they'll just put a fence up in their property to keep the bears out, and that is not going to do the trick if there's a potential food attractant in one's yard that the black bear wants to get into. Now, here in New Jersey, over three years between 2010 and 2012, there were actually 54 bee yards that suffered damage by black bear, and those beekeepers actually called this in to New Jersey Fish and Wildlife. So these are reports of damage that our agency received. Now, this occurred across nine counties and as far south as Ocean County in Jackson Township. A beekeeper had a bear hit up those hives. Now, all of these occurrences of damage, they occurred either in the fall or the spring. Again, the two times of year these animals are most active looking for food. Now, damage did occur to unprotected hives, but some folks had made the efforts to put in electric fencing, and people do have to be very specific as to how that fencing is installed to make sure that it's effective as a bear deterrent. So I will touch on those recommendations in just a short while. But I wanted to let you know that even though we see lots of bears on the move every fall and spring, keep in mind there's also increase in bear activity throughout the summer months with breeding season, and that is also the time of year that sub-adult black bears, black bears that are about a year and a half old, they are actually dispersing to find their own territory to live in. So every June, July, in some residential areas, people do see these younger bears wandering through the area, and again, they'll definitely look for easy food sources while they're passing through. Now, a lot of times people do think that throughout the winter months, once these animals are in their dens, well at that point, you don't have to worry about seeing a black bear. But these animals are not true hibernators. They only sleep lightly, their body temperature does not drop down enough to keep them in a deep sleep. Consequently, they can wake up very easily and they may very well leave their dens. So people who live in the heart of bear country with the highest density of these animals, they've got to be aware that year-round, potentially you'll see a bear on the move. And statewide, while we do have bears showing up in all counties, again, it's possible one might see a black bear year-round. Now, at New Jersey Fish and Wildlife, our biologists have been researching and managing our state's bear population for more than 30 years now to look at the health of the population and also to determine how many bears are living in parts of New Jersey's forests. So our biologists collect a lot of basic biological information on these animals. Some bears are collared so that our biologists can monitor their movements, look at the territory they're living in, and seeing how long they live for. Right now, this time of year, our biologists are checking on the black bears in those dens to see how many bears are being born into our black bear population every year. Keep in mind, black bears in New Jersey are very productive. We actually have above average litter sizes of cubs Compared to black bears in other parts of our country in North America, the average litter size is three. We've actually had a town, Blairstown, that has seen its first female bear with six cubs. So keep in mind our bears are very productive. They have very long lifespans and very low mortality rates. So it's really been over the past 15, 20 years that we have seen a notable increase in our state's bear population. Now our most recent bear population estimate showed that as of the end of 2011, in northwestern New Jersey, specifically north of 78 to the west of 287, we do have more than 2,800 animals living just in the northwestern part of our state. And again, these animals are showing up statewide. If you compare the density of black bears in this northern third of New Jersey, we actually have the highest density of these animals compared to anywhere else in our country. So with that, people do have to take precautions if they are in an area with bears or hear about bears moving through the area. Now, at Fish and Wildlife, every year our agency gets calls on a variety of complaints and problems that people encounter with black bears. So I just wanted to give you a better idea of the most common problems that people experience with these animals and what staff at our agency is available to do to help address these situations. 
So we currently have what is called a category system in place. So if somebody calls Fish and Wildlife and reports just a bear sighting in the area, and that bear's not causing any kind of property damage or exhibiting any aggressive behavior, we'll just note that that is a Category 3 bear, a bear just being a bear, and we will not do anything to respond. These Category 3 bears may be the bears that do show up in more suburban or urban settings, especially those young dispersing bears. And at Fish and Wildlife, the only time a bear will ever get moved by our agency is if that bear shows up in such a congested setting, like in the middle of Newark or Paramus. If that animal cannot safely get out, that's the only time that bear is ever moved. If a bear has to be moved by our division biologists, it is taken to the closest state land with suitable habitat for that animal. So as bears are moving southward in the state, they are doing that naturally on their own. Category three bears may occasionally get into people's bird feeders, in which case those homeowners are told to remove those feeders. The most common calls we get are considered category two complaints, where bears are exhibiting minor nuisance activity. Consistently, the number one problem we hear about deals with bears in people's trash, so they really need to secure that. Category two bears cause minor property damage. In these photos, a bear was actually scouting out a den site under somebody's porch. So with our category two bears, we try to work with the caller and make sure they are removing whatever is attracting that black bear into the area. The most serious calls complaints we get are considered category one complaints, where bears are seen as a threat to public safety or they're causing extensive property damage. Examples of this include bears that are breaking into or attempting to break into homes, garages, vehicles, tents, sheds, that sort of thing. These bears are causing crop damage, causing livestock attacks, or maybe even pet attacks. Apiary damage is considered category one along with human attacks. And overall, these are extremely rare, but black bears are wild animals, so people do need to stay safe around them. And overall, we're lucky in that naturally, black bears don't want to be around people, and typically in a bear encounter, making noise, looking big, and slowly backing away from that animal will keep one safe. Now, every year at Fish and Wildlife, we do get a lot of calls, and this chart up here shows you the number of nuisance complaints our agency has received over the past 12 years or so. You can see that blue line shows that there's a lot of ebb and flow in terms of the number of complaint calls that we receive at our agency, but we really do need people to follow some precautions when they hear about bears moving through the area to help alleviate these problems. Now those bottom yellow uh, markers on that chart, that indicates in recent years when our agency has had a bear hunting season to help stabilize this expanding bear population. So. People who do have bears in the area, one of the best things that people can do to prevent damage to structures on their property and things like your beehives is to properly install and maintain electric fencing around those structures. Now, properly installed electric fencing, it is safe to people and pets. Modern fencers or energizers, they are very effective in being set up so that they are safe for people. Now, it's also the most effective and efficient method for preventing bear damage that we have in, um, available to us. So electric fencing can be used around a variety of structures. A lot of our beekeepers in northern New Jersey, they are having a lot of success by using electric fences. So certainly people that have them around beehives, they're also used around livestock or pet pens, around orchards. We even have some campgrounds that have electrified around their dumpsters to keep black bears out of them. So with electric fencing, it basically works so that when the black bear comes into contact with the electrified wire and the ground, it completes the circuit so that the electricity produced by that energizer flows through the electrified wire, through the animal, down through the soil, back to a ground rod and the negative terminal on that energizer completing the circuit so that that black bear does get a shock. It has a very negative experience and it's not gonna wanna go back to that fence structure in the future. Now, when putting in a fence to be effective for deterring bears, there are different 
things that people have to take into account in terms of the types of components you're using, how you're actually constructing, baiting, and maintaining that fence. So I'm just going to quickly run through the standard recommendations that our biologists encourage people to follow. Now the recommendations I'm going to touch on, again they are uh, proposed by our division biologists, our Bear Project in New Jersey. It's headed up by Kelsey Burgess. He's had years of experience seeing firsthand what does and does not work. Um, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, they have some of the most current recommendations available. And Living with Wildlife Foundation is an international organization who's had biologists for years who've been studying the efficacy of different fencing designs. So keep in mind, these are recommendations that are made by local and international biologists. Now, anytime you have a structure or something that might be attracting a bear, like your hives, when you're setting these things up in your yards, you want to keep them as far away as possible from cover for bears. So the recommendation is that you'd want to keep your hives at least 50 plus yards away from potential bear cover, which includes those wetland areas or wood lines. Bears will take advantage of it if they can run into one's yard, grab that food source, and head back to a covered area. So you really want to keep things as out in the open as possible. When you're considering putting in your fence, you want to determine if it's going to be a temporary fence design or a permanent fence, and that's going to have an impact on some of the materials that you use. But you do know bears are active year-round potentially, so a lot of people who are installing these fences are going for permanent designs. Now, with your bee yards, typically they're a smaller area that you're covering, so when you're um, installing your fencer, you're going to have a energizer that has a joule rating of between 0.7 and 1 joules in order to be effective. For larger orchard areas, energizers have to have 1 to 14 joules to be effective. Now, when you are installing your fence line, you want to make sure that your fence is at least four to five feet away from your hives. Black bears are extremely large, powerful animals. They will try to go under, through, or over those wires. They could potentially reach over a top wire and get a hive if it is too close. So again, you want to maintain that four to five foot distance away from your hives. You also want to make sure your hives and fence line are away from any trees. Now, black bears are excellent tree climbers. We've had beekeepers who think they've gone to great extents putting up these fences, but it's by a tree. The bear's climbing up those trees out on a tree limb and actually dropping in by the hives and causing damage. We've also seen some people who have used trees as a fence post. Again, that does nothing to deter a bear. It easily lets the animal hop over that fence and get at that potential food source. Now, when constructing a fence, you also want to check your local ordinances. Some require that particular signs be in place, that sort of thing. But most people who are farmland assessed, it um, shouldn't be a problem by any means. Now, with your fence setup, there's different components that you're going to be looking at from the energizers, your grounding system, the wires you use, the fence posts you put in there, and your fence testers. So these are the main components. And when considering these components and making them effective to keep bears out, as I've mentioned, with your energizer, the unit that actually electrifies or provides the electricity for your fence, the most important thing you want to see is that the joule rating on that charger is at least 0.7 joules in order to be effective for black bears. So that's the number one thing that you want to look at. Now again, larger areas, you can do the joule rating of 1 to 14 joules. If you compare black bears to horses, when you put in an energizer to keep horses inside a fencing structure, you can get away with a charger of 0.1 joules. But again, these are big, powerful animals. You're looking at least 0.7. Now, when you have your hot wires electrified, you actually want them to have at least 6,000 volts running through those wires. So the joules and the voltage are the two first things you're going to look at when you acquire your energizer. Now, generally with your chargers, there's two types available. There's your plug-in chargers, and there's also <coughs> battery-operated, which can also have a solar power backup, too. 
Your best bet with an energizer, what biologists recommend, is ideally you want to go with a plug-in model. They require a lot less maintenance, overall they're more cost-effective, and it's more of a foolproof uh, system if you can go with a plug-in. So that's your best bet. If your hives are in more of a remote area, however, you're going to have to look into a battery-operated energizer. And when you're doing that, you want to make sure that you have a deep cycle or marine battery with at least 12 volts and 70 amp hours. If you're using a solar panel array with your battery, you've got to make sure that your array is powerful enough to be able to charge up those batteries. And with your energizers, you just want to make sure that they are compatible with the wire type that you're going to be using. So again, chargers, that's the number one thing you need to look at to make it effective. The second most important component of your fencing system is your grounding system. Now, you're going to be placing your ground rod close to your energizer. You want to use one ground rod per joule of energizer output. So most bee yards typically just need that one ground rod. Your rod should be about three-quarter of an inch in diameter, and you also want them to be made out of galvanized steel. You don't want these rods to have any paint or rust on them. Um, that will affect its ability to carry the electric uh, back to your energizer. So with your ground rods, your best bet is you want to drive them at least six feet into the ground. Now, biologists at Fish and Wildlife, when we've gone out to hives that have um, had problems by black bears, even if people have electrified around them, we often see a problem that the ground rods are not put deeply enough into the ground to maximize the surface area. Now, depending on where you live in New Jersey, that can be tricky if you're living in a rocky area or if you have very dry soils. If you are in a dry soiled or sandy soiled area, ideally you're going to get that rod in deeper than six feet. If it's a rocky area, you want to put your rod in at a shallow depth but a steep angle to maximize that surface area. It can also work well if you use multiple ground rods, like three rods at 10 foot intervals if you are in these drier or rockier areas. So you really got to make sure that ground rod is properly installed in order for it to be effective. And it can help if you are in a dry area to actually water uh, your soil regularly to keep that area nice and moist and carry that charge back. With your grounding system, there are two types of fences that you can consider using, an all-hop fence design or a hot ground fence. For temporary fences, those are typically all hot in that all the wires are electrified, they're hooked up to the positive terminal on the energizer, and then your negative terminal is just hooked up to your ground rod. This does work well in moist areas, but for permanent fence designs, it's more often recommended that folks go with a hot ground system where you're actually alternating those hot and ground wires. And that can be more effective because these hot ground fence designs, they're not as susceptible to weather conditions or soil conditions throughout the year as an all hot fence would be. So depending on um, what your setup is gonna be, you're gonna design your fence accordingly. So after you've picked out your charger and you've got your ground system in place, then you're looking at the types of wires that you're gonna use for your fence. For bear, you wanna make sure you're using all metal, high tensile, galvanized wire. Your best bet is you wanna go for steel wire. That is the number one recommendation by our bear biologists. Your steel wire should be 14 or 12 gauge. Now steel wire can be tough to work with if you compare it to aluminum wire. Aluminum wire is very conductive and it is uh, more malleable, but aluminum wire can break. And these animals, again, are pretty big. We actually have some of the largest black bears here in New Jersey compared to anywhere else in North America. Our adult males, Average around 400 pounds, we weighed them in more than 700. The state's record bear was right around 825 pounds. So you have to factor that in with the brake strength of your wire. That's why you're ideally going to use steel wire. If you're using a temporary fence design, again, you can get away with aluminum, but we encourage steel. Poly wire can be easy to work with, but if you do want to use poly wires, it's got to have at least nine strands of the steel or aluminum incorporated into that. Uh, electric fence companies, they will also sell poly tape, but keep in mind, at this point, poly tape is not effective for bear exclusion, so you want to stay away from that. 
Now, some folks do like to use wire hog or paddle panels in addition or in lieu of traditional wire, so that is an option that can be considered, and that can actually also help when you're making your grounds um, underneath that bottom wire too. Now, fence posts come in different types, from wooden to metal T-posts, plastic or fiberglass. Basically, if you're putting in a fence to keep bears out, don't use fiberglass and don't use plastic. You ideally are gonna use these wooden posts. Now, you always wanna have your corner posts as uh, these treated wooden posts. If you are using temporary fence, you could put in those metal T-posts, but again, the wooden are the best way to go for stability. When you're using the wooden and metal T-posts, you do have to put in insulators, which you don't have to do for fiberglass or plastic, but they're just not strong enough for bare exclusion. Like this photograph shows a pretty nice fence setup, and overall things look good. The wires, you know, far away from the chicken feed, that sort of thing but those fiberglass plastic posts, the bear can easily knock them down. Now, another important thing you have to do is get a good fence tester. So you can make sure that your hot wires are emitting at least 6,000 volts. And you want to make sure that you're using a voltage meter so you can actually see what kind of output current you're getting in your wires as opposed to just a voltage reader. And again, you want at least 6,000 volts. So. These are things I hope that you will take into account if you are looking into this when you get those different components together. And I just quickly wanted to run through when actually constructing the fence, um, what you should be doing again to make sure it's effective for black bears. So overall, you wanna try to have a simple and strong fence. You wanna keep that at least uh, four to five feet away from your structure like your beehives. And when you're determining the shape of your fence, you're gonna go for a square or circle fence, but you just wanna make sure that you have a closed loop. So basically you're gonna to have to put in an electrified gate to get in and out um, to your beehives. If you do have an open loop, if that does not uh, get electrified across the gate, you will see a voltage drop the further away you go from the energizer in your wires, and you don't want that. So you're gonna mark your post locations, you're gonna drive those corner wooden posts, reinforce them with braces, and then it is very important that you clear the fence line of any grass, weeds, or vegetation because that can short out your fence. So you're gonna start after you get the corner posts in by removing any vegetation. You can use an herbicide. Some people like to use more organic options. If that's the case, you can use things like wood chip, mulch, or landscape fabric covered with gravel for the fence line. You don't want to clear more than an 18-inch strip underneath that bottom wire because the grass and weeds, they actually help that bear to ground better. So again, you don't want to clear too much, but you do want a good 18-inch strip cleared under that bottom wire. You're going to install your line posts at about 10 foot intervals, 8 to 12 feet works best. If you get those posts too far apart, you're going to start to see more of a sag in your wire that weakens the fence, and again, these strong bears could potentially push through that. So you want to keep your wires nice and tight. So your permanent fence design, definitely go for solid wooden posts throughout with your 12 to 14 uh, gauge steel wire. Temporary fence, you're using your wooden corner posts with metal T-posts potentially along the line, ideally steel wire, but consider aluminum or poly wire as an alternative. Now, after you've got your posts in place and your vegetation cleared under that bottom wire, then you've got to get your ground rod put in place near the post where you're going to have your energizer. Again, you're targeting at least six foot feet into the ground with that ground rod, or you're gonna go with that shallow, steep depth if that's not an option for you, potentially with additional rods. You wanna get your insulators installed on those metal and wooden posts, and then you're actually gonna get your wires in place. Now, you wanna make sure that your electric fence is at least four feet high with that top wire. Again, bears can easily lean over these fences if it's not high enough, and you want to make sure the spacing between your wires is close enough together so that a bear is not going to try to squeeze through it or even underneath it. So with your hot fence wires, keep in mind you want to use at least five strands, and your bottom wire should start at four inches off the ground. So, for example, you're looking at a spacing of 4, 16, 26, 36, and 48 inches to take you up to that four feet in height. If you're using a hot ground system, with those alternating hot ground wires, you actually need six to eight strands. 
And you want to make sure that your hot wires are never more than 12 and 15 inches apart and your wire spacing overall is about 6 inches. So those are the things you're keeping in mind to make sure your wires are spaced appropriately for bears. I mentioned you do not want sag in those lines. So a wire strainer can work very well to keep those tightened up. And when you're putting in your bottom wires so that they don't get shorted out, you can use stones and weights to make sure that they are kept at the correct height. After you've got your posts, ground posts and wires in place, then you're actually installing your energizer with at least 0.7 joules to have an output of 6,000 volts. And you're going to actually be uh, hooking up an additional strand of wire to your energizer terminals and then either your hot wires or with your negative energizer terminal that's going to go to your ground wires and to your ground rod. And then you can actually turn on your energizer and use your fence meter to check the voltage and make sure again it's at least 6,000 strands. So overall, I briefly mentioned with your energizers you're going to try to go with a plug-in if possible, that is your best bet. If that can't be done, you're going to use your battery operated, potentially with a solar array. If you are using a solar array, you've got to make sure it's positioned toward the south and in a really sunny area. Our biologists have been called out to inspect damage to hives where people had fences in place and they thought they were okay. They had their solar panel recharging their battery, but they had a big pine tree right there that was shading it out. So these are definitely some things people have to be careful of. Ideally, you're going to at least use a plug-in for two, min two months before you switch over to battery operated, if that's possible. And this photo up here that was contributed um, just shows a really nice uh, wire design with five electrified strands of bark wire. And then there's actually two feet of chicken wire at the grade, which helps to keep those cubs or skunks out, too, from trying to squeeze through. So you can have the best fence design in the world, but if that black bear doesn't have a really bad experience when encountering that fence, it's quite apt to come back again. So you want to make sure that you bait that fence so that bear gets a good shock in its muzzle area and is not going to want to come back. So you're actually going to bait your fence at three feet height all the way around, and you have to make sure that your bait is fresh. So bacon can work really well. This is a nice way to apply bacon to the wires in this photograph. But again, you've got to check it regularly so it is not drying out. If people have trouble with bacon, like if the crows are taking it, peanut butter on foil can be a good alternative to that too. So every week, you do need to be out there staying on top of your fence system to make sure that it is working properly. Check that those wires are tight. Make sure they're giving out the correct voltage, that those wires are baited with fresh bait, and that your solar power or battery uh, chargers are working properly. You will need to change batteries regularly if you're using one of those systems, and check to make sure that your battery is not uh, getting corroded around the terminals or eyelets. Another really important thing people need to do is actually walk the fence line and make sure it's not getting shorted out by any growing vegetation or insulators that may have broken or any debris that may have fallen on the fence line. So again, you can put in just a standard electric fence, but you want to keep these things in mind to make sure it's effective to keep bears out of your hives. Now, anytime you have questions or problems, if you're in an emergency situation with a black bear, call your police department, but you can always call New Jersey Fish and Wildlife's Wildlife Control Unit. Our biologists can provide very specific instructions about what is going to work well around your bee yard. And anytime you have questions, problems, or concerns, you can always call Fish and Wildlife at this hotline number on the screen. Now, our agency does offer depredation permits to farmers who are experiencing depredation by black bears. So that's something else that beekeepers can keep in mind. So I did bring with me today on the table back there some brochures with more information about New Jersey bears and our hotline number. We also have lots of information on our website along with some other resources that we encourage people to check out to make sure you're getting the most current, best information about installing your fence. And on the screen, these are just some 
fencing suppliers that do a lot working with um, fence installation to be effective for larger predators. So just some companies to keep in mind. So I do want to thank some of the beekeepers in the room that were gracious enough to submit some photos to get included in this PowerPoint as good examples. And I'd like to thank you guys for your time and hopefully you have some more food for thought about what does and doesn't work for excluding bears um, from bee yards. So, bee yards. so thank you very much. Hear that? Hear that? You can't play dead with a bear with a black bear. They like to eat dead stuff. Don't do that. <laughs>